Good afternoon, everyone. So we'll kick it off with uh, the um, continuation of the M chord track. And so um, we'll start with a talk on hybrid access, or better say, multi access chord. And uh, so this is part of the use cases that were uh, developed for M chord. My name is Manuel Paul from Deutsche Telekom, and uh, I'm doing this talk together with Adnan Salem from Redesis. So, um, question before we dive into uh, the multi-axis chord itself. Did everyone have a chance to take a look at the general introduction this morning from chord, or is there a need to have a brief intro or a recap of um, what M chord is doing? No? So everyone familiar with that? So then I think we can just uh, browse over since Ogos has already introduced this and um, oops, go directly to multi-access cord. Okay. Uh, thanks, Manuel. <clears throat> so this is uh, multi-access cord was a project uh, that uh, Redesis and uh, friends from Deutsche Telekom put together just a couple of months ago. Um, and what that uh, involves, uh, as the word describes, multi-access, is really the convergence of wireline, what we call R cord, and uh, an M cord mobility uh, cord solution into a into an integrated into an integrated solution. So I will get into more details in terms of what the end-to-end -end demo, uh, which I believe was demonstrated a couple of months ago at uh, Mobile World Congress Americas. And that showed a live working demo of a residential wireline uh, subscriber from a CPE uh, who also has LTE access uh, to be able to use a single cord pod that has an int integrated and reusable uh, hardware and software components uh, that serve uh, both concurrently um, wireline and, uh, and wireless uh, access in, in a converged uh, uh, net, uh, solution. So hence the, <clears throat> the word, and I think some People have referred to this in the past as H chord, and people have asked us, is that the same as H chord, hybrid chord? So I think it's just a terminology difference. So if you ever hear the word H chord or hybrid chord, just switch over to multi access chord because it's, I think it's the industry's kind of adopted that terminology now as multi access so that it's not a hybrid of two things. It's really allowing the chord solution to be applicable to uh, various access types and not restricted only to residential and not exclusively restricted to mobility. So with that, Manuel, would you like to kind of do an overview and I can describe the demo setup? Yeah, okay. Great. So um, multi-access cord, actually, what is it good for? So, um, and as we see here on the, uh, well, simple or really straightforward overview for this network topology setup, it allows the connectivity or it allows to connect, first of all, a CPE, <coughs> So a customer premises equipment and uh, in that way a fixed network subscriber or subscription through dual connectivity using uh, both the wireline as well as um, a mobile access connection through this eNodeB here uh, to get multi-access, so to get uh, multiple accesses used and um, aggregated here at the uh, edge. So Edge actually um, provided as means of cord um, and the special or the specialty about uh, multi-access in that case is that it includes virtual OLT, so R cord services as well as M cord and with that virtual EPC services and related components. So what does it bring for the user? It's more bandwidth, so it allows to use um, bandwidth from uh, both types or several types of accesses, right? And um, with such hybrid access as said, right, this is actually what the, what the service then uh, is able to use. It allows to uh, connect such residential gateway and any other device behind that is using uh, this connection to really provide enough bandwidth for bandwidth-hungry applications. And um, as a second improvement on uh, just a single connection, you can, of course, control the connectivity and manage the connectivity according to a policy that allows to use um, 
by application really the um, most appropriate path in the network and to uh, load balance also uh, on a best fit. So um, when we look at multi-access court and uh, the infrastructure, right? So um, Adnan is going to give you more details just in a minute. We of course uh, are able to benefit from the extensibility and flexibility that CORD offers with um, well, uh, the infrastructure, the underlying infrastructure and means of uh, disaggregated uh, network. SDN and NFV enabled uh, control and uh, then uh, in that way, collide this here for those two profiles, R chord and M chord. So for the demo, um, as a recap, right, this was uh, shown uh, at the Mobile World Congress Americas in September in San Francisco. So there's a connected, um, dual connected CPE. And uh, this CPE actually, um, well, has a, uh, has a um, as a client device, right, uh, or for client devices, it provides um, the uplink through um, Wi-Fi as well as uh, through a, a dongle to LTE. And um, with uh, logic that is implemented, it allows to actually uh, load balance traffic through uh, the hybrid accesses. And um, so that... Um, aggregation point that is located then in the network at the edge and the core POD brings uh, the um, connectivity together and uh, for that it improves actually how applications can run. So um, that's the basic demo setup and with that I will hand it over. Yeah, sure. Thanks, thanks, thanks Manuel. So uh, the the demo uh, setup. This is kind of showing a block diagram view of a single uh, single pod, uh, what we call uh, OCP compliant uh, rack that you see on the right hand side there. Um, and of course, it has a management switch, uh, the typical configuration fabric switch, uh, an OLT uh, for the wireline access, and a number of compute nodes and power supply units at the bottom. So one of one of the drivers for use uh, for supporting multi-access cord is not only for some of the reasons that I think the manual already described, but it, but in, in addition to the reusability of the infrastructure, because there are certain hardware and virtual component uh, assets uh, that make up cord uh, that are reusable uh, between wireline and wireless access. So this <clears throat> this demonstration uh, was really set up to show that how the the infrastructure uh, can be reused uh, when a subscriber is given or has access both wireline and uh, and fixed access <clears throat> uh, from their premises. So here, as you can see, the uh, compute nodes um, start kind of going bottom up from the compute nodes. <clears throat> There's base cord capabilities um, that would be common between residential and mobile cord. Uh, the ONOS and the XOS layer, and the OpenStack infrastructure that is really common between uh, <clears throat> common between whether you're doing wireline or wire, wireless access. So this is a very high level view. Of course, it's not going to the into the details. I'll show that in a second later. Um, so all the common components are what's showing cord compute three and and another cord compute that is uh, providing external gateway access. So any of the common components that require compute functionality are being shared between wireline and wireless access. So above that, there are of course going to be some virtual components that are mobility uh, centric, meaning very specific to mobile access and other functions that will be very uh, wireline OLT uh, access focused like vo uh, VOLT and uh, and Volta. <clears throat> so some compute nodes that are there are um, R cord specific virtual functions, as you can see that on the right hand side, where it says R cord compute two, VLT agent, VSG, and other functions that are very R, R cord specific run on those compute nodes. Whereas just to the left of that, compute one is all the EPC and some of the RAN related stuff that's needed to make M, uh, to make M cord uh, available. So there's reusable components and separation of what makes what is unique to M cord and other things that are more unique to residential cord. So that's kind of what the what the pod looks like. And on the left hand side, you'll see as as Manuel described earlier, your customer premise equipment. Uh, has LTE access as well as wireline access. So here's the here's the LTE enabled uh, LTE enabled uh, CPE wireline access here, LTE access there. And just for the purpose of the demo, uh, we just set up a, a local Wi-Fi hotspot. So the actual customer with a tablet 
can access Wi-Fi into the CPE, and then there's <coughs> there's a dual paths a dual paths available there. So, and in the next uh, in the next diagram, going to show you more of a um, walkthrough in terms of what happens uh, and the and the flow of uh, user plane data, uh, whether it's coming from wireline side or from the wireless side. Um, so, if we follow the path um, straight down to the bottom here. So this would be from the PON access from the CPE devices I just described, PON access into, into the OLT, and the VOLT is the virtual component that handles uh, the user plane uh, traffic coming from the OLT. It then goes into a set of services that the VSG provides, not listing all the details here, but you get to conceptually what an r -core system does, and it gets connected through a, through a gateway. So that's your standard, standard path, uh, a, a, residential, a, resi a residential cord or r -core path. At the very top there is a typical M cord only, as if you had deployed M cord standalone on its own, the path would be go through the wireless access, the radio access part of it, MME, the EPC components, VSG. So as you can see, there's two VSG components being instantiated here. I'll explain in a second where the second one, what the second one is doing. The first one is a standard M cord path, meaning if the subscriber connected and that service was exclusively as in the conventional M cord deployment, that traffic based on its source IP port would tagged accordingly and would follow this path and through the network slicing and routing configurability of that service, it would follow the standard path of mCord as if you had just mCord deployed on its own. So rCord on its own as if an mCord service is on its own. This is the interesting part. This is what makes a multi-access cord. So there are cases where you would want the services that you are providing for the wireline subscribers to also be reusable and applicable to a mobile to a mobile device. So for those applications and use cases, the traffic gets steered through here through the mCord path and gets connected through these the second instantiation of a, a, a VSGW and a P gateway. And MA cord applications would then are reusing the services that are common to uh, residential, wireline, or wireless services. So this provides the, the services to be reused. So if you've implemented something here for our court, those are automatically available to the, to the uh, subscriber if they came in from the mobility side of the, of the connection. So that those two services don't have to be, don't have to be recreated and reinstantiated either in different pods or even on the, on the same pod. So it's literally the same virtual functions that will serve both sides if they if those services are chosen to be uh, common between those two between those two paths so in this multi quote unquote multi access cord then as you can see you can run the pod uh, this core deployment as a as a pure standard conventional path of mo mobility access or you can have it strictly residential access in some common cases the common services can be can serve, serve both from the same virtual functions and the routing and finally i think in this demo what is interesting or being demonstrated is that on a per application basis, the subscriber, what they're looking for, the policies and configurability and programmability of the network allows that certain applications based on their port numbers can have a preference to go to the wireline network or to the mobility network. So if you're doing a huge movie download, for instance, or some other thing that's going to consume a lot of bandwidth, you would naturally want the policy to have that request served through this access network versus the versus the mobile mobile access network, where other smaller use cases that don't consume a lot of bandwidth will will get selected and, and go to the mobility side of it. And if there's common applications, a common instance will serve serve both applications. Um, with that, I think I'll maybe leave it. If there's any specific questions on this part before we kind of move on to where we're going. <clears throat> with recommendations uh, and suggestions for additional ideas going forward on the multi-access side. So, other than the outage situation, what's the business case to send anything over mobility that's probably a lot more expensive than your fiber? Yeah, absolutely, a yeah, good point. I think so. So first of all, I think as Manuel described earlier, one was the aggregation, so that you have higher higher bandwidth available, not with LTE, but maybe even more so going forward with 5G. So that's one, so you, you, you do get higher aggregate bandwidth. Second one is that one side of network can act as a as a backup to, to the other as well. So, sorry, that's the way, yes, right, that's the outage case. And um, I think that also allows one side to be configured independently of the other because you, you, have, you have two accesses. So in some cases we've seen that if somebody gets a new wireline connection, 
just to bring that up and configure it, you need to have some connectivity to do that instead of sending somebody on site. So if you have one connection available there, through that thing you can configure, you can configure and update the pro, uh, profile and feature set of whatever something, the, the new access that you're adding because you already have one access to start with. Emilio, so, was there? No, I think you covered okay. it pretty well. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So in your uh, examples here, right, you're essentially treating that connection on the multi-access as the SGI connection, exclusively the SGI connection. There's no other communication from the P gateway on the mobile access port out to the end. It's all being dumped to the uh, virtual uh, the SGI. Yeah, I think if I understood your question correctly, the, the this this here would be the SGI access part of it. Well, right, I'm actually looking down below where you've got the, the multi-access. Uh, oh, here? Right, so you're essentially pushing the, the default. Yeah, this, this is right. In, in this current, in this current uh, demo, it is actually, um, oh, sorry, uh, it is actually a uh, wireline. Yeah. If, if you want uh, a wireline profiled um, multi-access, right? So you actually um, uplink or um, yeah. connect to whatever comes after the data network, right after the um, you know the BSG. Yes. So no, there's no VI, VI LAN, uh, sorry, SGI LAN services or service areas connected yeah, uh, per se. Because it's a default, I was just wondering if you actually could, because it's a simple you know configuration. If you had the default route going to the internet out of that guy, and just selectively service down to the BSG. That that would be something. Uh, you know that could be done. For for here, it's actually uh, the aggregation point is in here, so that is uh, still an overlay. But um, I don't know. Um, uh, we will get to some some ideas going forward uh, that are related to this um, just in a minute. So, but first, looking if there are still other questions. If not, then maybe we can. Yeah, we can uh, actually take that as uh, a perfect. Uh, uh, you know, uh, a perfect uh, question towards what we are currently thinking and uh, uh, looking at. So when we just consider where we are, right, uh, and count into that, well, A4, right, this is uh, the DT project doing um, uh, an R-Core profiled uh, access network virtualization, right? So counting into 5G is at the doorstep. And so there's a lot of development going on in the industry and in the standards with regards to 5G. Then uh, we can consider that what we currently demonstrated with multi-access cord is at the, uh, it's it's a first step to a consolidation, right? So the POD, uh, the uh, edge cloud site that has um, multi-access cord in place is actually a place for local consolidation of a packet gateway and a BNG, so subscriber edge type of functionality. However, um, when we look at the 5G roadmap and the development going on with regards to the functional architecture, we see that um, in the end, there is a potential even to um, not just work as kind of an overlay, but consider a functional convergence when it comes to the control plane. Even before that, there would be, uh, at this point, a next step that can help to consolidate and uh, converge on the user plane, since considering a bare metal-based user plane approach, uh, and bare metal, uh, in that case, for the um, performant implementation that allows to support the user plane and not just um, the mobile, but uh, as well the um, um, you know, the fixed uh, subscriber um, related user plane. So we just needed to think the control user plane separation and count that we have the two control planes as um, SDN applications, which is uh, just uh, what uh, Oak was presented this morning, right? Uh, as well, the thinking uh, going forward to use programmable hardware um, to actually support such different types of SDN control applications. This would be an intermediate step to, to get to um, a functional convergence. So um, that's, that's one um, path going forward that um, multi-access and actually um, multi-connectivity can take using the principles and uh, the, uh, the platform, right? And uh, just, yeah? Yeah. 
on mm -hmm. the, <coughs> the far left hand side, which is local, local consolidation. Right. Or the set of slides that we showed. And and what that's doing, it, it's, it doesn't have a converged user plane. Just to be clear, the slides that I described in terms of what's being done. It's used R cord and M cord virtual components onto the same pod and sharing some of the physical and the virtual resources that are available. It hasn't done more than that, but it's allowed both of them to coexist and hence the, the, the location consolidation. And I think further consolidation, I think as Manuel described, right, would be to also consolidate so you have a, a single user plane, a converged user plane, whether you're coming in wireline or mobility. And then going beyond that, the work that's going on, I just want to set the stress that the, the 3GPP and, and BBF work that's going on and actually in terms of a uh, converged control plane as well. Yeah. So we'll be looking to maybe, you know, opinions and uh, from the industry in terms of what next step we should maybe take collaboratively on the on these two next steps that uh, that Manuel just described. Sorry, thanks. Oh, thank you. Yeah, are there are there any thoughts on this? Um, in general, looking at M court and the way forward. I mean, certainly this goes into then. Uh, as described this morning, uh, it actually profiles an application or um, is a profile that has both M as well as R in it. So in multi axis per se, um, a collection now of um, both uh, profiles for wireline and mobile access, which makes it interesting, uh, first of all, to set step towards using programmable hardware underneath. Thoughts mm -hmm. just to qualify, right? So, Library Sprint working on the import on a lot of the open source control point stuff that's gonna we talked about earlier that's coming out in the first quarter. Mm -hmm. So, um, so far from what we've seen, there are three areas of concern. Um, and I, I think just what you have here for the basic use case, just basic termination, um, basic billing, uh, whether it's event based or session based, offline or online, should be fine. Uh, where we're um, finding challenges is in the 3GPP space, and, and I, I can't speak necessarily to the broadband forum, um, and hopefully they don't have these crazy use cases, but in the 3GPP space, there's a tremendous amount of events that come across that aren't actually user plane events. However, they require us to immediately report the user plane usage back for purposes of billing. Now, a good example of this is change of presence and other items. And I know I'm talking about mobility as opposed to fixed here. But in, in those cases, we're having a lot of chatter coming down to the user plane to produce a record that can then actually turn into a, a diameter communication. And so that has been um, an interesting challenge. There's a couple of design trade-offs there. But what we're finding is there's more and more of that type of traffic. And so we see a lot of triggers going down that, mm -hmm. once again, don't affect the user plane, but are all about just producing a, a simple entry. So that's, that's one issue. Right. Um, the other one we found is uh, when we try to consolidate multiple protocols onto the controller, the strategy we've arrived at for the, um, now, and, and this has to do with speed of the libraries and the technology, because we're getting around 3,000 TPS. Um, out of controllers uh, where we're using things like RESTCOM, so things with JSON parsing and stuff, and that's what we're looking at for 5G, something very similar, right? Mm -hmm. um, in, in those cases, because we're so focused on getting the libraries right out of the controller itself, we've really ended up with protocol adapters, right? Um, different types of protocol adapters, and then homogenizing them going to the SDA controller. So kind of that control plane you have over the right for us is really broken out into independent applications that terminate the protocol and then homogenize to a control plane where we then clean things up and go down. And, and unfortunately, that's kind of where we're at, um, but hopefully we'll, we'll get better at that. Um, and then the last thing, and, and, and I think it's the, the one that scares me the most, and it's also because it's the, the piece of software we're, we're just now developing, and that's the, the policy decision one, uh, really, the, the piece of our case. Um, not or, or having that in multiple cases with different configuration, we have not yet determined whether or not what you show in the middle and above is feasible. Not from a, a technical perspective, but from a practical operator perspective. What we're most afraid of is I think what every operator is afraid of is someone on their operations team being very creative and creating a situation that as we try to actually converge, uh, the protocols are sound, but the policies themselves are not. 
And so I think we're still looking for that mythical, you know, policy reconciliation mm -hmm. language or software, whatever exists. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. uh -huh. um, but those seem to be, I think, at least with what I see in, in the middle and uh, the uh, converge on right, seem to be the three areas. But everything else, mm -hmm. I think, is perfectly fine, pretty straightforward. It's just work. Yeah, so, uh, well, thanks thanks very much for these, uh, I would say, very qualified and detailed comments. So, obviously, uh, Sprint, uh, you're from Sprint, right? Yes. Uh, yeah, so, um, uh, I think you're you're also uh, a lot into this, right? So, as it seems. And um, so, definitely, those are challenges around. But, uh, in general, um, as we, are, I think, also discussed this morning um, and heard, the, the use of programmable hardware really allows to do a number of things. Certainly, you need to architect it right, and there are still some, well, let's say, there's still some issues around policy control and um, all, the, all the necessary things to do, um, let's say, in the, in the carrier network architecture uh, today. So, yeah, yeah sure. Yeah, yeah. I think the first 85, 90% is going to be very straightforward for the um, And then, as always, right, the the barrier to launch will be the last 5 or 10%. And, and what I would call the, the, the crazy things that are done through GPP and other standards. Yeah, okay. Well, thanks very much. I don't know if you still have a minute or if you're uh, out of time with our talk. Okay, so we had another slide, but then I will just uh, maybe um, briefly show it and ask for any feedback offline since um, uh, I will be around. And also, of course, Adnan will be here. Uh, so this is an idea um, what to do in terms of the hardware abstraction when we talk about the programmable um, fabric. But we'll just uh, close with that for now. And um, thanks very much for the your comments and, and questions and uh, the interest, of course. Thanks, Bernard. So rather than, um, I guess, talking about the lab results, since uh, our folks weren't really ready to share any lab results. I thought maybe I could talk uh, more about why we like MCORT, you know, and, and from that perspective, maybe I'll get some of your input to share with, uh, with us and the community as a whole. So these are, this is really, you know, some of the slides that we at ONF with O's, et cetera, we put together on 5G pillars. And, you know, in terms of, you know, where MCORT needs to go, from perspective of the air interface, from some of the virtualization aspects, the slicing, you know, some of the disaggregation that we're all looking at. And of course, you know, providing, you know, some of the 5G pillars around more spectrum software defined capabilities. So we have much more flexibility, so utilizing the cloud technology and uh, edge computing, of course. So with that, uh, some of the use cases that, you know, we would like to, uh, explore with uh, M you now has to do with uh, some you know low latency and you know being able to have a lot more number of devices such as IoT uh, as well as you know some of uh, the work around uh, some of the mission critical applications self driving vehicles and so on. Uh, do you have any slideshow? Okay, I could do that. That's actually a good idea. I thought they, they automatically go on the slideshow. They don't. <laughs> okay. Is it better? Okay. So, so pretty much these are the edge use cases that we are interested in in MCORD, and I think these are so far nothing new. But more importantly, uh, some of the 20 millisecond zone applications. You know, 20 millisecond zone apps are those that today we cannot handle with 4G because of the delay budgets that are associated with that. There was a nice paper that I read. I would recommend you guys. Uh, look at that, you know, with the future of networking challenges, case of mobile augment rea augmented realities. And uh, with that, these are some of, some of the notes that I took out from there, and these are very aligned with why we like MCORD, um, basically to exploit some of these functions. For example, AR offloading is, you know, is a bandwidth and especially delay constraint, and we all know that. And MCORD for the edge cloud can exploit uh, some of these in order to offload the AR computation, you know, with the distance UEs, you know, so, you know, example of that would be certain new application that could emerge that would run on Samsung or uh, uh, Apple devices, except they need to utilize some of the uh, edge, uh, uh, basically complementary applications. So the developers now have to think about what portion of uh, my application takes advantage of the device capabilities from the SDK and how I can I leverage basically some of the edge SDK that might be available. So we know that uh, real-time applications, you know, delay budgets are around 100 millisecond. 
uh, but AR, VR, our latencies need to be under 20 milliseconds. And uh, of course, single high definition streaming, they show it in that paper nicely, uh, why they're demanding sub 100 millisecond uh, one-way delay, delay budgets. So um, we believe that the smartphones are suitable for you know, basically augmented reality applications. Therefore, you know, let's look at m you know, as, as how we can leverage that you know, going forward. So we like m obviously, you know, and, and one of the reasons that AT&T does like m has to do with how do we influence 3GPP in, in, a, in a new ways, you know, in terms of being able to showcase something in a proof of concept, coming up with the open API, such as what x has been doing, and influence 3GPP to adapt those, per se. Okay. Then um, comes, we look forward to, of course, m address, this 20 millisecond zone applications. You know, this is where we are not really leveraging some of the services today, or we are not able to uh, basically capitalize on vehicle 2x or you know some of the you know nice applications that could be associated with critical IOT and so on and you know can mcord help us do that and will uh, basically mcord exploit new class of use cases applications that can leverage edge cloud you know we talked a little bit about that how these emerging applications can assume that there are these acceleration at the edge of the network and then also, the next generation devices can heavily depend on video, extreme video, and fast learning modules. Can we apply machine learning at the edge or at the cloud such that emerging applications can take advantage of that, right? In terms of self, I would call it like, you know, towards more of a data driven networking. Uh, as we go forward. So, there are a couple of diagrams that I think we, these are some of the older diagrams that I had worked out at ONF, uh, you know. So, if the way I sort of I'm looking at things, of course, there are the radio, there are the access aspects, and there are the acceleration that are all part of the GPUs and FPGAs, and you know, some of the microservices containers that are associated with GPUs. Then we have basically the applications that abstracts these environment for the edge to the you know, upper layers, right? So how do we orchestrate these things? I mean, Larry talked heavily about you know, standard ways of doing that are utilizing Kubernetes and uh, OpenStack Helm, for example, is something that we've been talking to Gopi about it, and some of the ONOS extensions. Then there are control parts, control interfaces with respect to policies and, and service modules, and, and we need to think about how do we operationalize those? How do we get something like ONAP, for example, to uh, enforce or, or expose the policies to the edges, and then edge can, can basically enforce them. Analytics and measurements is really uh, heavily depends on what can be observed from the infrastructure, what can be observed from the edge cloud, and therefore, you know, we want to be able to do QoS-driven or uh, cross-layer optimization approach to some of the services that we are introducing. So being able to measure resource allocations effectively and being able to do basically a local breakout between different type of a spectrum that might be available to that particular users. Can we have dual radios, for example, to uh, do a local breakout between uh, some you know, CBRS and some other licensed spectrum that might be more efficient for that user? And of course, AR offloading and control. So this is more of a, a bit of an ONAP uh, perspective you know, to it. You know, then we want to be able to uh, have these service models defined. Anything that is in the infrastructure, and somebody needs to provide a model for it, such as even what can we monitor in terms of, of the events and alarms and uh, performance aspects of the syslogs. Can we describe it in some kind of model that say, uh, we expect from these VNFs this kind of stream events or this kind of structured events. And if we can define those, then it's easier for service designers and policy creations and so on to say, if these kind of events, et cetera, happens, of course, send them up to me to own app, but at the same time, take certain actions, right? So we expect these plugins everywhere that it can be either exposed you know, to own app for, for because of purpose of the old VNFs that are being you know, pushed to our infrastructure. And I think that was why I was sort of emphasizing earlier in this morning's talk that how do we enable uh, VNF vendors or VNF developers to come in and expose their VNFs in a 
a seamless way, you know, such that they don't have to go through gatekeepers to expose those, in a sense. So I think having these plugins are important. So this is more of one way of showing, you know, what, how we are going, for example, to introduce some edge uh, applications, right, in, in, in that sense. And I'm sure, you know, OS can do a much better job at, you know, describing the architecture aspects of it later and all of that. But sort of this is how we see it, especially anything that we do in the edge cloud, we want to make sure that, you know, we can't, it can talk to ONAP, for example, uh, going forward. So at last, I think, let me, uh, in terms of the observation so far, you know, without talking about the lab results, you know, of course, you know, m -Cord has shown uh, that interfaces can be opened up, right? We, we proved that we can virtualize the RAN. You know, we didn't know that two years ago we can even virtualize the RAN side. We only thought that EPC is the only thing that can be virtualized. And then we were able to basically influence 5G going forward. They have accelerated their standards. You know, they have realized that you know, open source community can be a complementary to standard bodies. And we've been showing various POCs. You know, and, and I don't have to dwell on these, but we are making progress are being sort of made towards 5G, especially some of the separation of control programmability aspects and all of that. So because we like m you know, and because we like to influence 3GPP, um, you know, and for that reason, we want to also be able to show that m uh, edge cloud or, or m in, in the edge cloud and all of that, you know, they cannot be separated. You know, for if you deploy 5G, you want to make sure edge cloud is, is part of that. So, so this is more of a very high level example of one thing that we want to show hopefully, you know, by Barcelona timeframe that if we put that m -Cord environment, we have an AR application and IO type applications or devices, you know, can, we, can they share this GPU acceleration? Can, can these apps uh, basically uh, assign different GPUs? If you have 100 devices that are want to get AR acceleration, and we have maybe 20 of these GPUs at any one time available. How can we share it among these 100 different UEs? Of course, not at the same time, but, but as the demand goes up. So, and we want to show this in a 20 millisecond delay budget, right? We want to make, make sure that from the time an app makes a demand on the edge acceleration until it gets it, is within that 20 millisecond budget. So with that, let me stop and pass it to the next speaker. Any questions for Tom? Maybe just, just one question. Yeah, sure. Um, so uh, you, you say, and I think I, I totally agree, it's, uh, it's a great opportunity to influence also the ongoing SwitchVP uh, architecture and functional specification work um, through actually prototyping and proof of concepting, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, um, yes, that's it. So do you, see, do you see any more direct uh, interaction also that the communities can, can have? Or is it really actually just through the membership that kind of does this um, through, um, you know, actually the, the contributions to both? Ends? So, so maybe also you want to address that, or you want me, you know, so so yeah. Obviously, we do like to go to 3GPP and propose, for example, extra APIs or, you know, whatever test results we show. The interfaces, additional interfaces that might be missing, in terms of the control, we like to go make a proposal to them and and then say here is the POC, here is the results. You know, can you make it part of the standard? So it is with the direct interaction, but we need to think about what's the best way to create that liaison that we do more of this, you know, more, much more often. That's a good question. But, but in any case, I would be very much interested in uh, contributing to that effort. Then. Excellent, yeah, let's work together to see what are the roadmap for 2018, you know, standards. Especially some of this modeling stuff and all that. You want to add uh, some more? I mean, adding to it, uh, we have membership from service providers and vendors at ONF, but we keep saying this is actually a service provider driven open source community. And as such, I think it might be a great opportunity for service providers to get together collectively, decide on what they like, and then push that jointly uh, within 3GPP. Uh, and ONF could be a great uh, place for, uh, for that to materialize. And vendors like Samsung. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, uh, uh, good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thank you, Osu, for uh, inviting me here. I'm 
Russell Ford from uh, Samsung uh, Research. And uh, I'm excited to share some of the work that we've been doing with uh, integrating the open air interface platform with MCORD uh, toward building this mobile edge computing test bed. Um, so uh, I'll just quickly go through the outline. So I'll give you some uh, introduction to our lab and why you know we're we're interested in uh, mobile computing. You know we're not a uh, uh, operator, we're a vendor, but uh, you know still we have I think quite a vested interest in uh, mobile cloud, mobile edge. Um, and so I'll explain why you know we are are pursuing MCORD uh, for our prototyping and research. Um, and you should all I assume you all are familiar with MCORD by this point, uh, but maybe not so much with uh, this open source uh, LTE and EPC stack called Open Air Interface. So I'll give you some introduction to that and its capabilities as well. And then I'll, uh, I'll tell you about how uh, we've gone about integrating this uh, into the MCORD environment um, and, uh, and also how we're approaching network slicing. Uh, so, uh, and, and then wrap up with some concluding remarks. So uh, our lab uh, uh, is based out of Mountain View, uh, our, uh, while our main office is actually in Richardson outside of Dallas, Texas. And we have roughly about uh, 50 researchers um, from the wireless networking and also uh, multimedia uh, fields. Um, and so our focus is, you know, we're heavily involved in uh, 5G uh, standardization. Um, and, you know, we are responsible for a lot of the early work, both with 5G, millimeter wave, and uh, massive MIMO, what Samsung calls FD or full dimension MIMO. And, uh, you know, we've done a lot of prototyping work to bring these systems uh, close to a commercial reality. Um, but we also, do, uh, we also do participate in the multimedia and MPEG standards as well. So our research kind of does kind of span the en entire uh, stack uh, you know, from the physical layer all the way up to the application layer. Um, and so we do a lot of work with VR, you know, high, net, high dynamic range, streaming, uh, and uh, next generation multimedia delivery architectures. So, uh, and, and of course, as I mentioned, we, we do a lot of prototyping to, to validate, uh, you know, the things that we bring up in standards and, and also uh, and do, to do research that you know, may ultimately uh, make it into a product for Samsung. Um, so, uh, you know, from our perspective, um, you know, 5G use cases um, are, are quite interesting and, and, you know, they call for, they really do call for, uh, you know, we're interested in this from the perspective um, of, the, you know, changing the network architecture um, but also new business models that, that are called for from, um, by these use cases. Um, so, of course, you know, immersive uh, real-time applications such as cloud, uh, VR and AR, uh, but also ultra-low latency, um, you know, applications like mission-critical industrial systems, uh, they, they really demand that the application as well as the, um, the core network, VNFs, be pushed out to the very edge of the network, um, you know, mainly because of, of latency requirements. And, uh, and, and so this is now motivating, you know, this, this transformation that I think operators are recognizing that, uh, um, you know, they, they may not be able to, uh, you know, that, that they need to be able to provide this capability for third party over the top uh, service providers to uh, go and deploy um, their applications and services close to the edge. Uh, so that's that's one kind of paradigm shift that's happening, but also uh, you can consider that with the the densification of the access network, um, the RAN that, uh, and and also the introduction of new licensed and unlicensed bands that uh, the you know uh, it's, it's a very large task for any one operator to take on independently, and therefore you know the, there is increased pressure to do sharing and pooling of resources. So. These are some of the things we're, we're thinking of um, when we participate in standards. Uh, and, uh, and so, you know, we are looking to build this uh, test bed uh, in order to do, you know, some fast prototyping and, uh, you know, develop these POC systems 
uh, from one um, one end from you know to validate some end-to-end -end, uh, multimedia applications such as uh, cloud VR and AR, um, but also consider new architectures uh, for say multi-ran or three you know integrating uh, inter or internetworking both um, you know 3GPP and non 3GPP access networks and you know there are going to have to be um, some definite modifications to the uh, core network, the next generation core uh, standards in order to make this possible. So we would like a platform in order to validate some of these things. Uh, but in the long term, you know, we're, we're interested in this uh, and, and you know, possibly contributing some of this work back, of course, to the ONF community. But, um, you know, in order to, uh, to you know, foster... Uh, you know, just and develop this platform for 5G innovation and end-to-end -end application uh, development. Um, so, uh, you know, our requirements are that we integrate open source solutions uh, whenever possible, just because, um, you know, the, the complexity now of tying together all of these components, just not only the, the EPC components, but also all the, the cloud, uh, you know, NFE, SDN, SDN and MANO, aspects, um, you know, this would be very difficult to build from scratch. Uh, so that, that is why we are pursuing MCORD as kind of this SDN and, and uh, MANO uh, platform. Um, but then, you know, for the, for the RAN side, for building prototypes, um, you know, we've, we have been working with this open air interface um, software-defined radio uh, platform for a little while now, and we think you know it has some advantages. Of course, um, you know for the the Enode B um, side, um, uh, you know it's fully open source, so you can go in and and implement new algorithms and and really modify anything in any layer of the uh, Enode B stack. Uh, but also, there is a core network implementation that has provided this open air CN, and you know we really haven't um, you know and. I'm not saying this uh, is competing with the uh, Intel or the NGIC um, solution that will be provided with MCORD um, 4.1, but uh, I think it's good to have some diversity. Maybe it's an alternative uh, EPC that can be used. Um, you know, I think the performance may not be, you know, anywhere near what uh, the, you know, Intel, you know, the multi-gigabit um, uh, throughput that that can provide, but um, when we started this out, the Intel uh, EPC was not yet available, and so we, we went this route, And uh, but I do think it has some advantages, you know, from a prototyping perspective. Um, it's quite easy to go in and, and modify things, and of, and of course the whole thing um, is open source, where I think still parts of the NGIC are, are not. So, um, just to skip ahead a little bit. I'm just trying to distill everything and summarize because I think we're a little short on time. So, uh, so talk about what OAI uh, provides. So, um, you know, it is this, it's an LTE, it's 3GP compliant uh, Enode B uh, and EPC stack, although only the MME, HSS, and then this kind of co-located that is Converge SMP gateway is um, what you get from the, the EPC. Um, you know the PCRF and, and other functions um, are, are are not included, but uh, it's C code. What's nice about it is you know it's all uh, you know all of the you know, all of these you know RAN and EPC protocols. It's all in C code and runs on x86 and it's highly optimized. So you uh, you can get you know in excess of 40 megabits uh, without any sort of FPGA acceleration or anything. Um, just you know, and you can just run this. On any laptop, and uh, you know it supports a variety of these software-defined radio RF front ends. Um, you know we're, we're using these ones from Edis or National Instruments, and uh, you know it's developed by this uh, Open Air Software Alliance, which is this other uh, nonprofit consortium, which is headed up by Eurocom, and there's a number of uh, mainly European operators uh, or European universities as well as some uh, operators and vendors who have done some joint projects with this, and some of them are quite impressive. Like there's this massive 64 antenna chain, uh, massive MIMO testbed that was developed. 
Um, and there's also been some CRAN work and, uh, you know, work to actually increase the throughput through FPJ acceleration. Um, so, so uh, in order to get these uh, EPC functions on onboarded into, you know, integrated into MCORD, uh, you know, I'll give you the gist of, of what I had to do. Uh, so, you know, or what we were looking to do, of course, is, you know, to get these instantiated as uh, VNFs and also be able to do some manual configuration. So you, you can kind of just fire and forget and, and you get a, you know, EPC slice uh, where all the VNFs are configured and they can talk to each other over the various vir virtual tenant networks. Um, and also, of course, we need to be able to, con to uh, connect uh, the OAI eNodeB over the S1 interface. Uh, so uh, first, I, I you know I created this custom VM image, and uh, where I have the OpenRCN uh, code uh, pre-installed on that, uh, and then I simply had to go in and modify some of the Tosca, you know, high-level mCore definitions um, in order to have uh, the VNFs. Um, uh, use this image. So I kind of stripped down so, uh, a lot of the services that were already defined in these uh, Tosca definition files. And uh, so I just was left with the uh, VNFs that I was interested in, the MME, HSS, and SMP gateway, and uh, you know, modified those to use this custom image. Uh, in addition, um, I had to expose the S1 interface of the MME and SMP gateway uh, over this flat network type, which um, you know basically it, it breaks that uh, interface away from the uh, OVS integration bridge, and uh, so you can get you know layer two traffic going over the physical interface on the compute node uh, from that from the MME and SNS gateway VM. Uh, so your your e you can then point your enode B to those two VMs to uh, um, have S1 communication, and then I uh, I wrote this Ansible playbook, which goes in and automatically you know conf uh, sets up it first waits for them waits for these VMs to come up in OpenStack, and uh, SSH SSHs into them. <laughs> Uh, and uh, you know configures various um, IP addresses so they can t uh, the MME the various VNFs can talk to each other um, over the virtual tenant networks and uh, you know then finally runs the the processes and uh, in a wait and checks to make sure they're correctly running and initialized so I have not yet um, implemented any synchronizer um, support for these but I think that's uh, that's in the next steps. Um, so, you know, ultimately, what we'd like to do is some uh, proof of concepts involving uh, network slicing. So, um, you, I'm sure you've seen some other uh, demos and POCs uh, involved uh, where you know, there's some form of network slicing going on. Uh, but I think what we've seen so far is typically, uh, you know, it, you kind of have an entire EPC instance that gets replicated for each of these slices. So that's you know good for this multi-access or uh, some sort of multi-tenant kind of use case. But there are other types of slices, of course, that are being considered in 5G. So we want to kind of approximate, try to approximate uh, something like that using 4G EPC. And so you you could consider you know just having the data plane kind of sliced off. Um, where you just have a separate, uh, you know, user plane function or SMP gateway um, going out to some edge node, or you could do something that maybe is a little similar to, uh, more similar to 5G, where you have the just the MME uh, and SMP gateway, uh, so you have both the control and user plane, uh, inst uh, multiple instances of those um, per each slice. Um, but where we you know, we will ultimately want to move to, uh, and of course something that is kind of a pre five G uh, concept of of network slicing, where you have some common control uh, network functions 
Um, I'm not going to list off what all of these are, but the, the idea is you have some uh, network functions that are common to each of the slices, and then uh, you know some that are slice specific, such as the user plane function, which is what the essentially the SP gateway is now being called in the 5G next gen core. Um, as well as some session management function, which is responsible for you know, bearer management. Um, so uh, some of this is already going on uh, to develop the architecture for this, even though it hasn't been finalized in the standards. Um, but this is going on with, uh, within uh, the Open Air Software Alliance. And so we're uh, you know, wanting to work with them uh, to uh, implement some of these functions in the Open Air code and then ultimately bring it into mcord. Uh, so um, so how, how we're kind of approaching this is uh, a little you know, simplistic and, and maybe a bit hacky. Uh, it deviates a little bit from the standards, but uh, you know, what we've gone and done is um, implemented support for multiple packet data networks so that the UE can actually configure a multiple APN uh, or access point names in the actual device. And based on those access point names, names, it can connect to one or more slices that are instantiated in mCord. Um, so the you know the APN will be uh, received by the MME during the PDN connectivity procedure, and uh, that will be used to map that session, a PDN session, to a specific uh, slice and uh, an SNP gateway uh, function. So uh, let me just skip ahead. And and yeah, we have multiple statically configured kind of SMP gateways um, that are defined in the Tosca. So I think I'm running out of time here. So uh, just to wrap up, so some uh, you know I put together a little bit of a wish list, and uh, from the talks earlier today, I'm encouraged to see that some of these things are coming already down the pipe. Um, you know, definitely we want to move away uh, from. Uh, KVM VMs managed by OpenStack towards Docker uh, containers uh, for our VNFs. Um, so the, you know, I think those are much more lightweight, uh, and with and the Open Air CN code is quite lightweight. So this can be run. You know, it 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 takes no time to actually run the code. It's just the VM initialization that that takes some time. So I think by moving to Docker containers, it would allow us to you know. Very very quickly spin up uh, EPC slice uh, with uh, the OAI core network, um, and uh, also you know having distributed uh, cord pods. So in order to actually demo a setup where you know you have one slice going out through the core network and another terminating at some edge node, uh, you need this. You, know, you need to have multiple sites. Um, that can be you know, managed by either by one core head node or by some distributed system of head nodes. So uh, uh, apparently others are interested in this as well. And then, uh, you know, of course, um, we would like to see what the, the capabilities of the uh, Intel NGIC EPC are uh, in the future. But uh, for now, we're a little turned off that it's not fully open source because as you can see, we're already going in and, and modifying some things and and looking to do things that are maybe a little non-standard uh, from the 4G spec. Um, so you know some future directions, as I, I, I mentioned briefly, we also are looking at uh, multi-ran uh, uh, convergence. Um, and uh, you know uh, one thing that I, I just thought of today is that in, in uh, open air, uh, there is the possibility of running uh, UE and you know be emulator. Or you can actually just run each of these um, normally, but have some loopback node mode where you don't need any RF hardware whatsoever. Um, just the the baseband um, data is just going, I guess, over the uh, or at some point the stack is split, uh, so you can just run your UE and you know be on you know one uh, x86 on one Linux machine. Uh, and I think this might be uh, it might present some possibilities. For using this as kind of an mcord test client, uh, of course you can use the the ran emulator, uh, and you can emulate many uh, nodes using that. But 
you know, say you're doing if for prototyping, you know, especially if you're introducing some new, you know, algorithm or doing something a little non-standard, this would allow you to make some modifications uh, in your actual, you know, eNodeB code, uh, potentially in the UE side as well, and then test how those integrate with, um, you know, your your EPC code running in mCord. Um, and you know, as 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 I said, we're uh, we're we're looking to do more five G like network slicing uh, with this platform as, as soon as possible. So, uh, thank you all for your attention, and uh, that's all I have. Yep. Bye. <laughs>